I'm a rapper, I'm not a poet Poet, I'm not a rapper Guess it's opposite there Cause you niggas just got it backwards Got me sick to my stomach Go, go for my lana New trio is free or the most terrible tandem Deliver shock value But no, not Timber Lannon Critical observation alerting you ambulances Clap on and clap off Rap on and rap off Hard times for hard rhymes That concrete, that asphalt If I did look twice I guess that's her asphalt Make I assist you And score, get my pass out Matter of fact, it's what you need Need to rest you just fatigue See, technically I'm filing Mrs. Wallace, I'm Rasheed Know this beat is a banger Have no reason for anger If I'm slightly deterred You know I'm giving a finger Call a savage like Corey But not in need of Topanga Right like 90 degrees You in the need of a angle Need of a angle Need of a angle Man, we back, we back, we back, we back, we back. Welcome to the Free Lunch Podcast. This is your boy, Tight, and I got BG with me. What's going on? What's happening there? How you feel today, my friend? Man, I feel real good right about now. Young, wild, and free. I told you, that's the motto. That's the motto, young, wild, and free. We out you. Man, I can't, I think, <laughs> I think today's topic and this conversation is going to be real interesting. I'm excited about this one. You excited about I'm, this I'm one right ex- here? I'm excited about this one. I anticipate a lot of text messages and, <laughs> and, and 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 comments on the blog and everything about this one. So I'm excited. About it. I like this guy. It's hot. It's gonna be hot. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I like this guy. It's gonna be. It's gonna be really not to dive too deep into it, but just to give people a surface level, we're gonna talk about the black church and the role that the black church is playing in in today's community but you know what uh bg i really i really think that this is more along the lines of accountability because when i thought about this topic and when we when we discussed it you know the first thing that came to my mind or the word that came to my mind was more along the lines of accountability and not really trying to point the finger or not really trying to you know, say one way or the other, but really just have some accountability around the role that the black churches is having in our community. And the blacks and the church, the church is a, a staple in our communities. We all in some form of fashion have some familiarity with going to church and having family members that go to church and go to church on a consistent basis. Um, so, you know, accountability and, and and it does the church have any accountability to the to the community? It's really worth talking about. It's real worth talking about. So you know what we do at this time though, right? You gonna do it for the vine? Of course. Of course. I'm on my way to the top. To the top. Yeah, started from the bottom, now I'm here. Okay then. Okay <laughs> but, then. But 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 you know, in honor of of the black church and in honor of today's topic i gotta give a uh can i just sing a hymn for the people do it for the vine can i just say i just want to sing a hymn and i'm gonna dedicate this to all the new school pastors that I don't dedic- do, that don't do hymns <laughs> that don't do hymns that, that, <laughs> that, that don't sing out of that red book i love that red book uh, 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 but, th- but see i'm gonna do a new school hymn i want to do a new school hymn that you ain't gonna find in that red book. It ain't in the red book. Uh uh-uh. uh. Uh uh. But it's a new school hymn. All right then. And I'm gonna dedicate this to the, to the old pastors and to this new to the millennium generation and and everybody that can understand these words. You ready? Get to them. When a rich dude wants you, and your dude can't do nothing for you, these women ain't loyal. No, these women ain't loyal. No, that ain't what he say. Yeah, <laughs> that that what they that what they preaching about, ain't it? That ain't what they say. <laughs> no, <laughs> that what they, that was that what I, that what they had in the news. That was no. that was one the pastor. That was one the pastors up there in no. uh, Baltimore. He said he say um the new hymn. That what they preaching about when a rich dude wants you, and your dude can't do nothing for you. These women ain't loyal. 
No, no. These women ain't <laughs> loyal. Man, we yeah, might well, yeah. <laughs> we might well go ahead and get that explicit rain label. Cause it coming, cause that ain't what they say, boy. Hey, hey, I said women. And I look- and, and I, that just that that was just a new hymn. And the new and uh, you know they used to have the red the red hymn book. Yeah, you know what color that hymn book is now? Nah. <laughs> what, what color is it? Green. <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything goes. Anything. The green, green light. That, that green light. <laughs> the green light. Anything they goes. Put, they putting anything uh-huh. in that hymn book now. Nah, that would they that would be the preacher now. This gonna be a good one, boy. This yeah, so good. so <laughs> so I had to get the people. I had to get the people ready, and 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 uh, I get the game sanctified. Ain't that? It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot that of places. It's a lot of places. Shoot, they doing. Uh, I've been drinking. I've been drinking. They turned that to a church song. I've been. I've drinking. been thinking. She say, I've been thinking. I've been thinking. Oh, uh, she could. She about could the say. Lord. <laughs> she could say, I've been drinking. I've been drinking that communion drink. <laughs> well, yeah, anything can be remixed now, man. Happy is a church song, so, you know. Man, man, you know what happy about it, man. It's levels to this. It's levels to it, and I ain't even going to, I'm going to say that, I'm going to say that happy, that happy talk for another time, because I tried to break it down for a few people, but they not feeling me on, on what happy really about. So, so that we get back on topic and we can get back to the matter at hand, Break down to the people exactly a, a, a provide a framework and a structure for today's conversation and on the black church and the black community and how you know from an accountability perspective or really just today's topic what direction is gonna go? All right, so let's go to church. So you know personally. You know, I'm a, I guess, a product of the church. Grew up in the church. Come from a family that uh, that that is church going. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in Sunday school and, you know, eleven o'clock service and you know, vacation Bible school and all those type of things for years, for years at a time. And so, you know, you get to this point in your life and you still, you know, going to church. You start asking, you know, questions about. You know, church and what goes on in church and to what we're going to be talking about in this podcast episode. To what degree is the church uh, to be held accountable for the things that are going on in the communities around it? You know, it's interesting to think that, you know, churches are basically in some places on, you know, in close proximity of each other. Some are across the street. You might have two or three in the same neighborhood. And so they're very visible. Some of these churches have been around for hundreds of years at a time. People go to these churches every Sunday, you know, and there's a pastor that's delivering some biblical message. And hopefully that message is something that those people, when they walk out of those church doors, they can take out into their day to day lives and apply it. But it's interesting that in those same communities where these churches are found, it seems like the situation that those communities were in 50 75 years ago, the communities are still stuck in that same type of situation. And so as a believer to where we are, you know, we we believe that the best is for us, that there are certain things that we should have, that we should be living a certain kind of way. What is the message that's being delivered? You know, when the church is there and we get these messages, but our situations remain the same. Does that build your faith? Does that keep your faith the same? Or does that kill your faith? And then through killing the faith, does it just, you know, kill the community's fervor to live better and do certain things? And so with so many people that go to church every Sunday in these large congregations and things like that, it just seems like to me that there should be more progression, especially in the black community, as it relates to you know, the, the church impacting and encouraging and educating people on how to get to that next level. Or is that something that the church should ev- even be um, credited with? It, should we even look to the church for that type of influence on our lives? Or should we just, 
See, church is a place where we go get information for the amount of hours that we spend in an 11 o'clock service and then just take that and kind of come up with the conclusion and what the application on our own. So that is the question is what responsibility does the church have in our community? So that's two that's, that's two things I actually want to kind of talk about today. So what is the responsibility? And I guess the second question is, is the black church letting the black community down? And and kind of what I wanted you to do for us was really for the next five minutes or so set the stage for the role that the black church play. I don't know. Let's just go back to the different. We can actually. I don't know if you did any research on this or not, but. We can kind of talk about however far you can go back, but set the stage that the black church played in, in three segments, right? So you got back in slavery time, the role of the church. You got the the role of the church during the civil rights movement. And now let's kind of set the stage for the role of the church in this era. So that's kind of like three stages, right? Because once we can define what the role of the church was, then we can kind of start to address some of these questions we just we just posed. Okay, so historically, you know, as it relates to African Americans and slavery, you know, religion in this form that we that we practice now was basically taught to us. We learned, you know, the whole church going experience and the Bible and stuff from. The, the 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 slave owners the plantation owners right and so you would have the the slaves sitting at the the, the scene is often said where the slaves are kind of sitting in the back they're in the same service with the the white church goers but they're in the back of course and they're getting this same message so the religion was taught to us right and then even with that religion being taught you know that religion was taught in a way that where you know the position of black people as slaves as chattel, you know, they use that to support, they use the Bible to support that treatment of, of blacks. And then as we progress into the slaves forming their own churches, of course, on those plantations, the way that they practice and the messages that were being delivered in those churches, of course, were restricted and restrained by the slave masters because they didn't want the, the the slaves to be you know be, to be talking or communicating about anything that would put in their minds that they you know that they should be seeking anything other than slavery all right so the messages was a was a real watered down message and it really wasn't one probably wasn't really one of application more so of something just to go and get your spirit fed and to keep you encouraged, come up with the hymns to keep you encouraged in the crappy situation that you're in. And that was probably the extent of it in that period of time. So it wasn't a lot of practicality in the religion. Uh, my understanding, I wouldn't know, but that's just my understanding in reading. And then you move forward to the civil rights movement. You know, I can speak to my my hometown, Selma, to where the church was a focal point. The church was a place where they 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 had the meetings to organize the demonstrations. It was a place where they would come in and learn about, you know, practices and methods that would be utilized in the boycotts and in the public demonstrations. And so it was really like a center that the people came to to get that message, to get that direction and that, and that instruction for what we were going to do as working people pieces in this movement and that was churches in all of the especially in all of the southern states during that period of time the church was the focal point the SELC um, was a Christian leadership uh, group built from pastors from across the region that came together and of course Martin Luther King became the, the 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 focal point or the focal member of that group but all these things kind of grew out of the efforts and grew out of the establishment of the church and so that was the role that it somewhat played in that period of time so so you said something so in the civil rights movement the church was was the focal point or the church was the was the place where leaders would go and meet to kind of set the strategy, the game plan 
for how they're going to push a movement forward, right? And they would also, and then they would also have the people come in, you know, they would have the meetings and the community, the people from the community would come in and listen to these leaders talk and get that inspiration and get that direction and instruction as well. So the church was the place. There was no other place that they could go like that communally to, to do those type of things. Hence why the churches became targets for the bombings and things like that. Oh, that's deep. That deep. So they weren't going to the community to the, center, to the community the center, Coliseum, the and arena, the Coliseum or the arena. They were they were going to the church. They to, were going to church to kind of game plan and set these 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 strategies and and these um, visions of how they wanted to move this movement forward. And then at the same time, I don't I don't have factual, but would you assume or do you know for a fact how? how the communities were benefiting from I'm just saying within that local community, you know, whether is that is that also where they had the drug store or the liquor store or, or they had the the crackhead house with that next door to the churches back there? Well, you know, they were probably in those areas very very close and nearby as they are today. In some neighborhoods you know, the church is in close proximity to all of the elements of everyday life. Um, and, and, and it's, and it's a part of the community just as, you know, the bootleggers house is and all that kind of stuff. So there's always probably been, you know, I, I guess that conflict or whatever in terms of these different, you know, these different institutions being in close proximity and then people just having to kind of choose, you know, where they want to spend their time at. Right, right, right. So, so now we fast forward to, to, to the day. And in a lot of instances, I don't even want to call some of the churches churches. I like to call them franchises oh. um, because a franchise is what? One place, multiple locations, right? Same church, multiple locations. Ain't that a franchise? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you, I guess you could look. I don't know what the definition of of, of, of true franchise is, but typically franchises, yes, is one place that has multiple locations. Okay. Uh huh. So so <laughs> so now they got franchises out here. These franchise churches. Um, and what is the role of that? As you see, um, what's what's the current role that that the franchises are playing today, from your perspective? That kind of sparked today's conversation. I don't know. That's what that's why the question therein lies. Um, you know, right now, my feeling is, is that, you know, there is no central theme like the civil rights movement was. There was a central theme that all, you know, that blacks that there was a central agenda that was that was that was on the the high uh, at the top of the priority list for the African-American community, for the black community. You know, the civil rights movement, civil rights, you know, defeating Jim Crow and segregation laws. That was at the top of the priority list. But right now, I don't know if we have identified a central agenda for our community right now. And so, you know, in terms of the church, the the churches have no central agenda as it relates to the community. Now, it is, you know, it is teaching uh, individual prosperity. And how you as an individual can be better and, and have a better life and, and strengthening your faith and those means. So individually, people are getting, you know, are getting built and filled. Um, and that's in certain places. Some, you know, some churches are better at that than others. Um, but it's fragmented. It's just an, it's more of an individual thing now versus a focus on, in my opinion, versus a focus on strengthening communities as a whole. And then you also have to look at some of these churches on their own. And man, the man had a, the joke about it. One of the comedians, but the, you know, say the damn church been there 50 years and they ain't changed the door knob on it. Right. Like the, how did that happen? If we taking up. <laughs> If we taking up a collection, we taking up a building fund, we doing all these type of things, and the church falling down, and this personally happened to me. You know, church is a historical place, been there for a hundred years, and we of course we've been taking up these collections and stuff for that period of time every Sunday, and the thing falling in, how well, does that the, happen? Did the pastor have a new Cadillac? No. <laughs> no, that, that that period of time the pastor didn't have a Cadillac. But 
but, 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 but where is it going? If you have to ask that question. He didn't have a new Cadillac. I don't think he was getting it. But where was it going? It wasn't going into the walls. It wasn't going into the doors. It wasn't mm. going into the roof. It was going somewhere. Unless our bills and stuff was just superseding what we were bringing in on a monthly basis. But See, that's, the, that's the type of thing, man. It's like, what are we doing? And, and you know, I've been biting my tongue here because I have very strong opinions around the, the current state of the black church. And for me, um, and let me put that disclaimer out there because I kind of said that at the beginning of this podcast was I want this to be more around accountability. And for me, and you kind of set the stage with the whole the role and, and, and the role that they that the, that the different churches played in the different in the different generations. But for me, what the issue that I'm having or the issues that I see with the black community, uh, the black churches and, and how, you know, I would tend to say they're letting the black community down is on three different fronts. Right. And those three fronts being pastors versus evangelism, the message that we're that we're teaching um, and then just the whole idea of franchises. So with the first one, pastor versus evangelism, um, and I'll share a story with you around that particular topic. But I think that one, the role of the pastor has kind of changed and evolved um, throughout the different generations and years. And a pastor, which by the definition that I grew up with was your spiritual father. And so when you think about that, you know, just think about that, your spiritual father. That's what a pastor was defined to me as growing up as a little child. Because similar to your story, I grew up in a church, you know, did church all day, Sunday and throughout the week. And then did vacation Bible school, participated in the in plays, etc. So I'm very familiar with the black church. And if the role of the pastor is your spiritual father, um, I would make the argument that we don't have any pastors anymore. We have evangelists. So that back in the day, we had pastors, um, and those were individuals that really cared about the people in the community. Um, what has changed is that that role has evolved into more of an evangelistic role in which they're in the pulpit preaching a message, but they're not acting as spiritual fathers. And and the reason I say that is because back in the day, I could have my pastor's number, and if I had an issue, I could call him, and we could discuss what that issue is, right? Because that's what a father would do. If I call my dad, he's going to answer the phone and call me right back. Today, with the evolution of the mega church, which in a lot of instances I'm not a fan of, but with the evolution of the, the mega church and, the, and, the, and these franchises, members have become a number. So you're not a name anymore. You become a number. And because you become a number, then that intimate relationship that you're supposed to have with your spiritual father no longer exists. Because your spiritual father becomes the pastor's assistant. Because that's who they're going to direct you to. You see what I'm saying? So how do I develop a relationship with my pastor when I'm a membership number and I can't even call him? True story. And then I'll kind of kind of let you comment on that. But I, I attended a mega church in Houston. And during that time... Um, you know, I I was pretty active and I knew the knew the knew the pastor pretty well. And, you know, we would meet up and we would um, after church or whatever, different church groups. And so I had his number and, you know, I talked to him after one of the meetings. I said, hey, I really need to talk to you about some things. He was like, yeah, call me anytime or what, what have you. I called him and he 
he didn't answer the phone. I was like, he just told me to call him today, you know. So then I called him again later that week. He didn't answer the phone. And I'm like, what's going on? Left two voicemail messages. He never hit me back. I would see I end up seeing him again and running into him at church one day, you know, months later. And I was like, hey, you know, I really was going through something in my life at this time, you know. Like this was genuine to me and this was something that was really important to me. And I reached out and you the day before had just told me to call you. And personally, I think he just said that to say it, not really, you know how people don't really mean it. And long story short, I saw him the next day and he was like, well, call me, call me tomorrow. He said, yeah, man, I saw you call, but I was at the airport, so I couldn't really talk. And so I was like, okay, why didn't you call me back? And he was like, uh, but, you know, long story short, that was really nothing to, to that whole story and that conversation. Uh, he left the conversation saying, call him back. Did I call him back? No, because by that point, I had already called him two or three times and he had never called me back. So why was I going to keep continuing to call, quote unquote, my pastor, who's supposed to be my spiritual father? And he won't even return the phone call of his, quote unquote, child. You see what I'm saying? So. The whole point being this, I think that one of the things that has happened with the role of the black church and the evolution of these franchises and these mega churches is that we no longer have pastors who I define as a spiritual father. The churches have grown too big. The churches have gone, grown big. And, you know, the argument is that pastors don't have time to, to call mm -hmm. every single member. Right. Well, right. don't call yourself a pastor. Call yourself an evangelist. Right. Because if you want to take on the role of a pastor, you're supposed to be my spiritual father. I'm not trying to talk to your assistant. Right. I don't need to talk to the assistant. I need to talk to you. You the assistant, not my spiritual father. Yeah. It's a it's a catch twenty it's a catch twenty two, though, because you know, you you look at the the places where you would be able to have kind of that 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 closeness and that that accessibility to your pastor would typically be a smaller church and all those type of things. But oftentimes in those churches, you're getting that same old thing. You're getting all the songs. You're getting the pastor getting up there. One scripture. He going to stay on that for a few minutes and then he going to get into that hoop and then a the person get on the organ and you know he about to be finished. So you're getting this whole emotional rush thing. But then when you leave out of the doors, it's like, you know, what was the what was that message really about versus and we can talk about ver that, too, because that's what another thing I want to talk about but go versus ahead. versus what you see is that. A lot of these churches have grown to be mega churches because of whatever it is that those pastors or evangelists are doing. And and oftentimes, because I guess the church that I attend now would be considered a, a mega church, a franchise, because we got two locations. But a lot of times in these situations, you might find, you know, guys that are actually doing more teaching. So when you come in, it's a structured, it's a structured message to where you're getting the scripture, you're getting the background around the scripture, and then you're getting the message, and then you're getting the, you know, tips on how to apply this message to your day to day life. And so you're, 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 you're actually feeling like you're leaving there with something more than just an emotional, an emotional rush. And so, you know, what do you do? I mean, you, you, you people are going to these mega churches because they feel like they're getting something. They're drawn to these churches because they feel like their time is not being wasted. You know, that they're they're actually learning something and their faith is really being uh really being cultivated and grown out. So it's, it, it 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 is what it is. And so so Well, let's talk about the pastor though cuz you you didn't ask that question what? or you never really commented around the pastor though. Well, is the pastors is the pastors more of being your spiritual father or they being more of an evangelist? You know why? Because what I'm learning or what I'm seeing, I got another example, but what I'm seeing is that most pastors, and this is again, this is accountability, right? Uh -huh. This whole podcast is around accountability and people can agree with me or they can disagree with me. I don't care, but it's more around the lines of holding these pastors their messages and the black church in general accountable for the development of the community. Mm -hmm. And the whole point is this. 
is is are these mega church pastors are they pastors are they evangelists and the reason why is because i guarantee you that that you can look and my access to that pastor is determined by my net worth <laughs> okay you see what i'm saying uh-huh. you see what i'm saying let me say that again my access to that pastor is determined by my net worth. So meaning, how, however much I bring in monthly and annually, in a lot of ways determines... How much attention you get. How much access I had to that pastor. So if my net worth is below <laughs> person Y, then they're going to send me over here to the associate pastor, even though I'm a member of your mega church, your franchise now. And you supposed to be my spiritual father. No, you got to go get your bread up if you want to talk to the pastor. <laughs> I got to go get my bread up. My cheddar. My <laughs> you got to get your... But you see, you see what I'm saying? And the reason, what, I'm going to tell you what made me think of that. What made me think about that and what, what, what really started that whole thought process was when, when I saw T.I. on stage at... Um, Bishop um Creflo Dollar, I believe. No, no not Creflo Dollar. It was the other one. The one uh Eddie Long, the one that touched them little boy. Oh boy. Accusingly. <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> allegedly. 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 Correction. Allegedly touched those little boy. So I was looking at the service one day and I'm like, why is th-? this was right when T I was about to go to jail for the whole B T awards thing and the guns, et cetera. And I'm looking on stage, and they and they call out T.I., and he on stage. And I'm thinking to myself, now, T.I., you know, he has a he has a lot of money. His net worth is more valuable, more than mine. So he probably, of course, he has direct access to Bishop Long, you know, because of his net worth. So I started thinking, I wonder if person Y who attends every Sunday, who net worth is, I don't know, 70000 uh, does he have that same access to, to Bishop Long or is he being directed to the associate pastor? No, he ain't, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, he ain't being directed to the associate. He going straight to the man. Who is? T.I. He got access straight yeah, to the Yeah, but man. I'm talking about the person Y, but person Y. Oh, no. Person Y that's making 70. No, the person Y that's making 70. Where he been? No, nah, he got to see to, he gotta see the assistant. That's what I'm saying. But that will be my spiritual father and I attend that every Sunday. See, a lot of cases and a lot of things to me, I label them, I label these mega churches and a lot of these instances as evangelists. They get up there and they can preach the word, and we need less evangelists and we need more pastors. So those are typically be the guys that would be traveling around, around like at the revivals and stuff like that. Yeah, they but they just have a they don't necessarily have a church. They just go different places and deliver the message. Yeah, but they but 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 I'm saying that that even these so called pastors that are calling themselves pastors. Um, of these mega church, even though that they're not traveling, they're still acting as the role of an evangelist, evangelist. and they're pastoring those who has a net worth of, of X amount. Yeah. That's, that's, some, that's some deep stuff. Now think about that, what we're saying. That's, 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 that, that's real. I mean, that's a real perspective, but that's tough though. I mean, you know, if you, if you got it, you establish a church and your church just, exponentially grows what you gonna do stop it tell it that don't y'all don't y'all don't come here so no but you no but you accepted that role and if i reach out to you then that's part of your responsibility if you supposed to be my spiritual father if i call my daddy right now he gonna answer that phone and if he don't you gonna call me back so i think that that's something that if you want to grow a mega church and it grows exponentially that comes with the territory I guess it I guess it does, but realistically, if you're getting that same call from, you know, fifty percent of the members and you got ten thousand members, that's gonna be you know, that might that might not be a realistic expectation. So I think it comes down. I don't down- know. I, I I'm not gonna sit up here and say oh, what's no, realistic he, and what ain't realistic, he, but I'm gonna say that you've taken on the role of pastor, and if your definition by my definition is spiritual father, then my daddy going to talk to me. So if that's Never. just too much for you and you can't hold that responsibility and if it's not realistic enough, 
I don't have the answer to that. All well, I know I, is that that what you that what you agreed to do. Well, one of the things that we that 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 we we you know the pastor always says at our church is that if you're not growing where you're going, you know you you might have to look at finding somewhere else. And so if that's a part of your expectation and, and it's a part of your growth, then it might be more of your responsibility to seek somewhere else that's going to give you that package, give you what you need for your own uh, spiritual maintenance. So uh, some of that responsibility may fall on the individual to say, okay, well, I like this church, but I don't feel like I'm getting enough because at the end of the day, because we do now have options you know, you have to take, you know, responsibility for it and, and, and seek out that place which is going to feed you the best. That's a good you point. Know? That's a good point. I'll take that. I'll take that point. That's fair. So That's the reason why I don't attend these franchise churches well, because and, and, and because I don't I need I need to be able to have access to my pastor and mm-hmm. I don't want to talk to to your assistant. Right or the associate so, or the associate pastor. Well, that's a good point. But I wanted to. Um, I don't know if you wanted to finish because I would. I did want to bring up one more topic around that um, that I kind of highlighted. But did you have something else you want to say on that? No, particular? keep going. Keep going. All right, message right. messages. So let's talk about the message then. And 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 the whole point. This was number two. Was that I think that the messages we can call them pastors. I I prefer the word evangelist. But the messages that these pastors are preaching today, in my opinion, you know, I feel like they're catering too much to the secular world, first off. And then second off, I think that the messages that they are providing are are so much about prosperity. Um, and when I say pro- prosperity, I'm talking about financial financial growth, Mm. versus and the and and also these messages a lot of times are are victim right so you got three types of messages in my opinion that have been that I wanted to kind of kind of discuss number one was um what I mentioned with the whole idea of um the secular so a lot of secular undertone in the messages number two the victim role of the messages how in a lot of our messages it's it's um it's almost like we're always in the victim role. If it's not the victim message, then like you know those those song when they say I'm going up, I'm going up uh-huh. on the rough side of the mountain. You know, almost the victim role. And then the third one is is the prosperity, always about always about money and and growth, you know. So those three type of messages, I feel like there's more more messages that we can talk about. Like, why not talk about prosperity from a joy perspective or prosperity from a um I don't know just there are other messages I think that can be shared but it tends to be like we're giving out the same watered down message or the same secular message where we're taking lyrics such as these women ain't loyal and yeah, preaching on say? that why why we not why we not why we not preaching on you know, we, we, in my opinion, the church should be setting the standard for the, and, and, and the secular world should be trying to take from what the, what the pastors are saying. But it's almost like it's on the other side. Like if you watch the movie Ray, and I'm going to let you respond, but if you watch the movie Ray, and in that movie Ray, you know, uh, Kara Washington tells Jamie, she says, you know, Ray, you don't need to be taken and stealing from the church. So essentially, R and B was kind of taken, and Ray Charles was taking the flavor of what the church was putting out there. So the church was setting the standard. But nowadays, when you go to church, it's almost as if the church is trying to take from what the secular is saying, where it's where 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 it may be using the best man holiday line or something or it may be using a chris brown lyric to get that point across so kind of wanted to throw that out there to get your your thoughts on that it's a it's a risky business um to debate that 
Uh, I would just say that I think in one in one instance, the the attempt is is to make that connection, knowing that the people that are coming to your church are also listening to the radio. They're seeing these movies and all this kind of stuff. And because of the way that our minds, you know, as today's people have, you know, kind of been programmed the way that we are, we are, you know, we're microwave culture and our attention spans are short and all this kind of stuff. You know, the the ministers. Uh, the evangelists, some of the gospel artists and things like that are using that to try to connect to the people to say, OK, you know, like I'm going to give you this type of beat. I'm going to give you this type of song to get you into it. But then my message is the same. So I'm trying to capture your attention with something that's familiar to you, but then also giving you my, you know, my biblical and my spiritual message. Uh, within that, which which works in a lot of cases, because there have been a lot of people that have been transformed because of the the evolution and this new approach to church and to gospel music and to 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 gospel plays and and, and, and motion pictures and stuff like that. So there are some people that are transformed. But the risk is, is kind of what you're talking about, is that the, the message get lost. And so you'll find yourself booty popping the Mary Mary. And it's like a song you really probably ain't really supposed to be dancing like that too but because it just feels so good to you you know it causes a certain type of response and the message gets lost um that's the whole point and that's the whole point can, i was it, trying to make it can, you just get, said it, it can get lost and for some people it can get lost not all exactly so so if i go to the if i go to the franchise right mm. And the franchise gives me a message, and the only thing that comes out of that whole sermon is these women ain't loyal. Then what have I learned? Because essentially, that's what people are gonna remember. So why not leave them with something that they can remember that is gonna be everlasting, right? But it takes and, and and okay, this is this is real good. I'm happy we're here right now. So take a step back. Most of the people that are going to these churches, in some instances, may be equivalent to you have levels of spirituality, right? So you have elementary level, you have middle school level, you have high school level. So if you're at an elementary level or middle school level, spirituality wise and you hear these women ain't loyal and that's the only thing you hear then you don't miss that whole message and you don't even know what the whole sermon was about you know what i'm saying but if i'm at a high school level where i can read between the lines or if i'm at a college college level spirituality wise and I can read between the lines and understand that that the point he was trying to make with that with that particular line within his sermon, then that's different. So I think in a lot of ways, when you're taking that secular tone, that can be a distraction, a distraction, and that can take people away from really hearing what the point is about. So you have to be very critical. And and and, and personally, I just, if, if, if I'm a spiritual person, I just don't like how the church has become secondary to the, to the secular world. And that's the, and that's the, that's the, that's the interpretation I get from when I hear a pastor use a line from one of the from one of the famous um at that particular point in time one of the famous um entertainers out you know i feel like they're they, i feel like they're 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 versus them setting the standard because we just talked about in a in another podcast that that you got to be you have to be the protagonist in your world so if i'm going to another if i'm going to the secular world and taken from them, then I'm becoming an antagonist in the secular world, whereas I should be a protagonist in my world, and I should create the standard. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I get that. I get that. But in, in, in response to that, you know, the, the also the, the risk in using, you know, some of the, the secular themes and some of the 
um, the, the secular elements in, in a setting such as the ministry and, and, you know, pastors using it in their message and stuff like that is that it, it's not so much of how it's, a, you know, how it's when it comes out in that message, what it's what is re- projected in the message. But you just create this lane for a snippet to be gathered from that. And then it, it becomes headline news, which is kind of what happened to that pastor. Somebody just heard that term or heard that phrase and ran with it. The pastor said these women ain't loyal in the pulpit. And we got the snippet. We had the disadvantage of just getting the snippet. But then when you go in and look at the rest of the message around it, it was a to me, it was a pretty sound message. Right. But we just because he used that for us on the outside, we just got that snippet. And then we were put in a situation to where we, you know, we had to form a judgment about like, why, why, why is he, you know, why is he using that? But he was taught. But see, but see, but you just missed the whole point, though. You. You you said earlier that that you've been going to church for all these years. Right. So your level of your level of 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 spiritual education or what have you is gonna be a little bit higher but, and you're gonna be a little bit more conscious and relevant to go back and listen to that. But message. the people but the people in the congregation had the privilege of hearing the whole message. And so they were able to put it in context. So it's really us overreact in my opinion, overreacting to the little bit that we got and not respecting in the, in his defense, because I, I, I kind of know what he was what he was trying to do. It may have been an attempted fail, but I know what he was trying to do. And I feel like the people that were there were able to get the rest of the message, which was talking about, you know, the importance of of the importance of the man and how you know man is under attack, and by man being under attack, how it affects households and how it affects all these things that we're talking about. And then he was talking about you know as a man how it benefits you to have a woman that's going to stand beside you, a woman that's going to be that's going to be loyal to you versus chasing a woman that's not going to be loyal to you because that'd be detrimental to your spirit. So so, and you know what? Go ahead. I'm sorry. And I'm just saying, so I think we were just put at a disadvantage because we live in this this snippet headline news world that that was blasted like all other things without telling the whole story. And I feel like the people that were there to hear the whole hour plus long sermon were able to overlook that small moment in time and really got something from the overall message. And we were just kind of stuck in with them. He said that in the pulpit what you know where is his where is you know where is his discretion as a minister in the pulpit and i would agree with you up until so so i listened i I went back and listened to that particular message um because i did want to see and and what he was saying was makes what makes sense and and everything you just said i would would have agreed with you the thing that turned me away from it was did you listen to that entire video on um, YouTube? Did you did you hear the whole the, the whole thing or watch the whole thing? Yeah, yeah, I watched. Okay, the whole at thing. the end of the sermon, they had <coughs> they had some commercials and marketing, right? Right, right. And on one of the marketing ones where it was talking about empowerment, did you hear the song that was playing uh-huh. for that one? Uh, uh-uh, what the song was playing? T Pain, welcome to my hood. <laughs> so right. so so right so, right so everything right. you just so. said i would say okay yeah 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 but right. but when right. you right. but when you but when you when you got as your as your um a song over to your to your promotional video t-pain welcome to my hood again i i can't co-sign these franchise churches taken from the secular and using the secular to advance a mess. I think it should be the opposite way around. I think that they should be setting the standard and these entertainers or whomever should be trying to steal from the church. And I think that because it's vice versa, I think that that's the issue that I have. I I think that how can I teach someone the way to go when when i'm when i'm teaching when i'm when i'm using the secular um the the song uh the um the hottest lyric of the day as my reference point well i might i'm confused now i might as well follow 
Chris Brown because because that's what we preaching on. Well, I mean, and that that you can look at it that way, but then I I then too because you have to look at you have to look at the society that you operate in and so i feel like you know personally the church has to do some degree of marketing to to get people's attention to get people in the door i think that that is that is a fundamental thing that the church has to do to to capture people man because people are so far gone and so far from, you know, what we would typically think is like being standing and all that kind of stuff that you have to do things like, you know, now a lot of churches where you used to, you used to have to go to church dressed up, shirt, tie, booted and suited, all this kind of stuff. But now it's like open door policy. Just come as you are. Just come as you are and and, and you'll be accepted and you'll be able to get this message. People have benefited from that type of environment. Some people are offended by it. Some people don't like that and once again here we come back to this place to where you just kind of have to find a place that provides that environment that you feel like you need to grow and I think it can be I feel like it can be levels to this thing as long as our message is that we're delivering and what we're instructing the people to do to do are on the same page it's fine it's it's fine to have a youth driven church a church that is targeted towards the youth and their service structure is different than the you know the adult structure I think that's okay as long as that teaching is sound in my opinion it, it is good to go now you have to have some license and all this kind of stuff of course, but the, 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 the church is competing. The church is definitely competing for souls. Bottom they line. Compete. Okay. Well, that's the, I think we need to, I think we need to do a part two on this one. Cause we pretty much had our, a lot of time, uh, but I, yeah. I really think we need to do a part two and really do a part two after we hear what the responses are to this topic. Right. Yeah. Because I think that this is going to generate a lot of discussion. You know, some people are going to agree with me. Some people are going to disagree with me. That's right. That's fine either way because the whole purpose is to spark conversation. But I do think at the end of the day, um, ultimately, we all can agree that there's some accountability that needs to be held over the heads of pastors over the heads of the messages that pastors are teaching and also over the head of the black church right? and advancing the black community because one could make the argument that there, that, that the black church has become um, less impactful mm-hmm. than it once was at a time. So I kind of want to continue this conversation, but when we continue this conversation, I kind of want to do it post the response of our listeners to see what type of thoughts that they have. And then we can kind of go in that direction. What you think? Let's do that. Let's do that. Definitely do that and give the people the opportunity to digest it and, and, and let us know what they feel about it. And we'll come back and put it all on the next podcast to part two. Since we marketing that thing, should I should I say welcome to welcome to my hood? Welcome to my hood. Yes, man. You can say you can say all that because that's, that's definitely a reflection of what this is. We welcoming people to you know where we come from and what we all about. All right, so go ahead and uh, you know do the do the do rundown, the, the rundown. Yeah, do the rundown. So yeah. c- contact us. So when you do. Uh, when you when you do come up and you have an opinion or something you want to say, you can uh, share it with us at our um, blog site. That's freelunchpodcast.blogspot.com. Freelunchpodcast.blogspot.com. If you prefer, if you would prefer to use Twitter, you can drop it on Twitter. Free lunch pod C. Free lunch pod C on Twitter. And then if you also want to, you know, send us a direct message or whatever on Instagram or just send a comment to one of our posts. Uh, our username is Free Lunch Podcast. Free Lunch Podcast on Instagram. That's all we got, yeah. bro. That's all we got, man. We just got to hold these people accountable. That's all. And can I leave out with another hymn for the people? You got another one? At the green book, not the red book, the green one. Get to them. When a rich dude wants you. And your dude can't do nothing for you. No, no, no. <laughs> These women ain't loyal. 
These women ain't loyal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, we done, man. I'm tired. <laughs> out of here. <laughs> we out of here. Peace. Fucking apology, fucking apology, apology.